Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Spectator Film Podcast. I'm Max. And I am Austin. And today, we're going back to our roots, everyone. We're going to do the sequel to the first ever movie we did in the Spectator Film Podcast, Predator 2. Not Predators, not The Predator, Predator 2. And this was Austin's pick, so I'm going to let him explain why we're doing this, besides the obvious. Well, uh, we both like Predators, I like to think that we both relate to Predators because we're both kind of like alpha personalities. Am I right? I'm more of a Sigma male. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. We're really alpha. Um, That's why we host a movie podcast. Um, (laughs) Obviously. (laughs) So that was the first big reason why I chose this. But really, a quick sidetrack. Is that just astrology for incels? Like the whole like male grade? Well, yeah, it's not real. Yeah. But like that's I think that's like the same thing okay going back i just needed to get that out there maybe it's not as developed as astrology there aren't as many (laughs) yet yeah there aren't as many varieties of like male yet but we can we'll get the entire greek alphabet in there well well, we got alpha we got beta we got ligma i was gonna make that same exact (laughs) joke i was literally gonna lead up exactly to that yes but uh okay yeah (laughs) um (laughs) <laughs> but Predator 2, uh, we're doing this movie aside from that reason. Uh, just because uh, why the fuck not? That's why. Um, I, for some reason, had an impulse to revisit it. Uh, I think, Max, the reason I decided to revisit it is because Criterion is releasing Deep Cover, an amazing cop movie about the war on drugs starring Lawrence Fishburne and Jeff Goldblum, directed by Bill Duke who was in the first Predator movie yes, um, and is a great actor and director. And uh, Deep Cover is such a good movie about the war on drugs. Uh, it's such a good like city cop movie. And that made me think of Predator 2, uh, obviously because of the Bill Duke connection. And then revisiting it and watching it before we decided to do it for the show, I actually felt, you know, there's actually quite a bit to talk about with this movie. I don't think it's like the most amazing movie, but... It's a movie that, as a sequel, has been, like, roundly dismissed. Uh, Mostly forgotten, with exception of that one famous scene where you see the alien skull. That's the only thing people remember. But there's a lot of really interesting stuff in this movie, and I think, in many ways, uh, it makes very bold, creative decisions that I like. And uh, I think think that it develops the idea of the Predator in a way that I find really interesting in relation to themes of, like, U.S. foreign policy, and the idea of, like, U.S. empire. Um, I think those are two really interesting things that when you compare this movie to the first one, it sort of brings... This movie helps brings it out of the first one more when you watch it in retrospect. And, uh, yeah, I just think it's uh, pretty compelling in that way, even if it's not, like, fully realized. So this is going to be a bit of a switcheroo, but I do not like this movie. I think it's a relatively bad sequel, I think it takes a lot of what made the first Predator great and kind of waters it down. I think it has some neat aesthetic elements, and as much as I think it kind of over-explains the Predator in certain ways, I think some of the stuff they add is very neat. But overall, I, I don't like this movie. I don't think it should be dismissed. I think there's stuff in here that's interesting and worth talking about, and it's an interesting look into a 90s approach of a similar idea as to the very, very 80s movie that Predator is. But I don't think it's a good movie. And in a world where you could just watch the first Predator again, or even Predators, I I can't, I wouldn't recommend this movie. I I generally, I I don't hate it. It's not something that I would just be like, oh, this is the worst movie ever made. But I, I, I don't particularly like it. I don't think you could even, I mean, we're just on completely opposite sides of the planet here. Yeah. Like, like I wouldn't even say that Predators is in the same like realm of existence as this movie. Predators has nothing to say about fucking anything because it takes place on a completely different planet with like random ass people from all over the world that have no connection. Predators is like, it's about family. That's what Predators <laughs> is about. It means absolutely nothing. That movie's stupid. Um, this movie, it even in its messy trashy exploitation death wish three sort of way Uh, i think it articulates something solely the name of death wish three by comparing it to this movie you're right death wish three is better than this movie um and charles bronson as we know would kill the predator 
instantly, instantly, instantly. Uh, so, um, uh, no, I'm just thinking of a Death Wish movie where he's his family is killed by predators. <laughs> he's not taking them down. He has to plots along at his elderly pace to catch the predator. He has to make himself look like a dangerous target so they hunt him. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, so, uh, yeah, we just totally disagree about this. And it'll be interesting to talk about it uh, over the course of the movie. I will agree with you, though, that it's a completely different movie from the first Predator. And I think if you... If you're someone like yourself who wants your Predators to be in a movie that is like the first Predator movie, you're going to be disappointed with this because it has completely different goals and uh, it doesn't really have the patience of the first movie in any sense. Uh, but that being said, I think I, I really appreciate that they tried something different and went in a new direction. I appreciate that. I just kind of wish they had gotten in a different direction. Well... How about we go in the direction of starting the episode, Max? I think that's the right direction for us. Okay. Goodbye. Now, Max, isn't it sad to know that this 20th Century Fox logo is now obsolete for any future Predator movies because it is now owned by Disney? Uh, isn't everything owned by Disney now? Almost. Almost. <laughs> this particular deal where Disney got a lot of those 20th Century Fox properties put them pretty close to the edge where they own everything. It definitely is easier now to try to come up with things that they do not own than they do. At what point do antitrust laws like kick into effect? Like a hundred years ago. <laughs> I mean, true, but like... Does Disney ha literally have to own every form of entertainment before they're like, wait a minute? Hmm. I think the end goal here is we're going to turn the entire United States into one giant Disneyland. <laughs> we'll all live in it. We all get to that. That way, the uh, people who are pretending to be upset about Disney getting rid of some racist characters on their rides, they they can build their own racist rides in the big Disney world that is America. <laughs> There's going to be a racist land. <laughs> It'd be great, everybody. But you know what? Maybe then we'll get some fucking infrastructure, some monorails. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, but it'll all be made out of cheap plaster. <laughs> it will look good, but it will fall yeah. apart at the yeah. slightest breeze. Yeah. Half the U.S. population will be wearing goofy outfits. <laughs> Young children will be dying in, of heat stroke in the environmental crisis. Uh, and then this will be us. We'll be these gang members shooting Disney fans. In the new Disneyland of the United States. Welcome to the commentary track for Predator 2, by the way. <laughs> um, this is the wonderful opening action sequence. Now, Max, you don't like this movie, as you said in the introduction. Can you explain how this opening action sequence did not charm you immediately? I think it's quite fun. Um, I, I think it's fun. It's, it's a good action scene, and it continues in the spirit of Predator 1 of starting your movie off with a literal bang of we're just going to throw this gigantic fucking action set piece very early on into the movie. What's the action scene at the beginning of predator one with the storming of the camp. It's not quite as immediate in predator one, but hmm. like the storming of the camp and the command, sure. the commando sequence in predator one. Yeah. But the problem I have with it, and I think we sort of worked this out before we started recording was I kind of wanted this to be more like the first predator, not like I don't want them to make the same movie again, but I like the genre twist of the first Predator. We did From Dusk Till Dawn recently. And although I wasn't, like, we didn't say that was a perfect movie, the genre twist stuff was some of the strongest parts of that movie. Well, it's fun to see. That's a great explosion, by the way. Yes. I think we can both. I That's just the way they flip that car. That's pretty amazing. I, that's wonderful. And a great use of slow-mo. Not yeah. an annoying use of it. A very appropriate. But um, continue. Dusk Till Dawn, genre yes. swap. Yep. But the problem I have with this is they reveal the predator's involvement way too soon. And from that point on, it stops being a crime genre thing that's going to turn into a predator movie. And it's a crime genre movie that is getting in the way of a predator movie. And although it doesn't last nearly as long as I like, you might think it would, I kind of wish that this movie developed its core cast more explored their relationships more and really got the crime part down 
before it turned into a sci-fi slasher movie like the first one did. Mm. But I acknowledge you can't do that completely because the magic of the first one is lost. We know it's going to be a predator. This is a double-edged sword here. Yeah. Yeah. Damned if you do, damned if you don't. But the direction they took this movie didn't particularly work for me. Well, I think the thing that you're articulating here that you enjoyed about the first one is you enjoy the um, sort of uncanny reveal of the predator. Yes. Where uh, and something we talked about in that episode, our very first episode is how that movie really beautifully sort of relies on a certain set of horror movie aesthetics in how it hides and then uses the predator. Um, and it really like builds up those moments where you get close to seeing it or whatever. And in this movie, we've already seen the predator vision. You're absolutely right. I mean, this movie doesn't play coy about the predator in any sense at all. Right. Um, However, I ha- I have to say that like even with this opening action sequence, I feel like this opening action scene completely differentiates itself from the one at the beginning of Predator. Um, mostly because I think it's very important that Predator does not begin with an action sequence. Something that I really admire about that first movie is its patience. That's something that's not in this movie. Uh, it wastes no time whatsoever. Like at all. We already have this amazing, huge opening action sequence and I feel like it's using this opening sequence to really like buy my interest, if that makes sense. Um, it's trying something new and it's, it's making me want to put my faith into it because it's exploding shit on such a massive scale in the first five minutes. And then it's doing this crazy stunt stuff with Danny Glover. And it's like, this is great. I mean, it's ridiculous, but it's great. Um, it's, it's not trying to do the same thing in any sense as the first movie. I think that's the right call. I think something we talk about too with sequels is like, you have to do something different or you should do something better. And I think if you were trying to do a very similar movie to the first one or even approach it in the same style, I feel like it would be very challenging to do it better than the first movie did it, you know? I agree. But as I said, like I I think the crime drama thriller type thing that they could have gone with would have been strong enough to do something different without just sort of throwing up the genre twisting things all away. So if anything, I, the impression I'm getting is that for this movie, you wish they had kind of had more space to commit further in a direction. It seemed like they might go in. Yes. Yeah. So you like that it's different. You just wish it was a little bit more different. Exactly. Yeah. You either make a better movie than predator one, which is going to be very hard or make a different movie that is also good. Yeah. But I, I, I don't think this movie is good, unfortunately. I want to like it. I do. And there are parts I really do like about this movie. So why would you yell? Just the, your shotgun firing. Max, first shut up. Is gonna... Shut the fuck up. If you shoot someone, you're going to yell at them first. You're going to say, hey, pussy face. I'm about to blow your pussy face off. <laughs> whatever the fuck Danny Glover says to the predator at the end of the movie. Uh, or no, what does he say? He says some motherfuckers are always trying to ice skate uphill. That's exactly what he says. Yep, and then he shoots the predator. <laughs> I thought he sliced his head off with a samurai sword and a bad CGI <laughs> effect. He says, Oh my, 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 oh Gonna piss off that one guy who was <laughs> mad that I said his no. emails about no instead of mo. If you're really that upset that I said omayawa no shinderu as opposed to omayawa mo shinderu, come on, man. <laughs> and I love this because there's like someone listening to this who's 57 years old, uh, and for the who last 30 the seconds has no idea what we're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> It's like they're just making baby noises. Oh, I thought you were going to say it's the 57-year-old who was like, grew up reading the original run of Fist of the North Star and was just like... <laughs> I've been saying that the longest. How can you possibly say it wrong? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. We now know that Danny Glover is... No nonsense, I do things my way. I don't have time to play by the None of that cop. Juris my diction crap. Yeah. What movie is that from? I don't know. All of them? Sure. I do think Danny Glover is a really fantastic He's a good cop. Lead. He's a good lead choice in this movie. Yeah. Well, and that's another th- reason, Max. I'm going to disagree with you about the direction they could take this movie in. 
I understand your impulse to want to have a similar aesthetic to Predator, but I think that really works because of the leading man. I think it works because the structure of the movie is building towards this mono e mono climax. Um, but you can't have that with Danny Glover versus the Predator. Yeah, but they still try to. They, they The whole ending sequence of this movie is an elongated fucking back and forth chase fight scene between Danny Glover and the You Predator. have to admit it's different though. It's not fetishized no, it's not, combat in the same way. It's not one-on-one -on -one masculine primal combat. That's what I'm talking about. But it's it's still a similar mono-on-mono -mono, just, one -on -one just because it's literally one-on-one -on -one doesn't mean it's the same thing as the first movie. I'm talking about the first movie in the way that it builds up to that really satisfying final stretch of Arnold versus the Predator. And it really makes it very dramatic and uh, like you see, vaguely erotic. I, I think you could have done something interestingly different in this movie, though, where the fact that like all of his like band of miscreants, not miscreants, but like cops, his, miscreants, yeah, his weirdo cops, yeah, they all get killed off or taken out of commission, is kind of a weakness of this movie because the first predator builds up to the big masculine primal fight off, but. Throughout this entire film, he's talking about like the emphasis of teamwork and we need to work together and have each other's backs out in the streets. Otherwise, we're going to die because nobody else cares about us. Not our higher ups, not the mayor, especially not the gang members. So we need to work together to have each other's backs. And that's why he tells off the Lone Ranger character played by Bill Paxton when he's first introduced. And I think if he had worked as a team with his unit, they could have done something that fits his character fits the themes of this movie. So you would have rather had them to have some sort of plan or something. Yes. Instead of him yelling at the, the pussy face and, and <laughs> you need to stop. I, well, the movie's not going to stop. So we're, we're going to keep rolling with it. However, I can understand that. But the point I was trying to make is that it's a fundamentally different approach to making an action movie and they could not get Arnold for this movie. And I've seen multiple different things about that, why they couldn't get him back. I read one thing that said it was a scheduling conflict with T2 and Arnold chose T2, although he was interested in this movie. I read another thing that it was a, uh, you know, a, a pay thing. They weren't willing to pay him as much as he wanted. Um, but they originally had planned to get uh, Arnold and potentially have Arnold with Danny Glover or something like that. And that's a little bit different if you have Arnold in there. Um, with Danny Glover, this becomes a completely different type of action movie, and I think it's smart to avoid trying to create an action movie <laughs> that plays off the strengths of an Arnold Schwarzenegger yeah. when you don't have Arnold Schwarzenegger. So I feel like it is hard to do the same approach, kind of, because you want to have uh, something that favors more the, the, the actors that you have. And Which, I, you're right, I think you know this movie has a strong team cast, you know, maybe you could have leaned into that more. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, you, you, yeah, don't. We're just going to keep back going back to the same thesis statement of do it better or do something different and good. And it, it just falls short in that aspect for me. Now we see all these blood splattered mangled corpses and they blame the Jamaicans because that's that's what they would do. Well, who the fuck else is it going to be? Uh, I, I would assume like a wild animal got in here or some shit. <laughs> in L.A.? Yeah. In, in the dystopian world of 1997? Yes. Animals are extinct. They don't exist. No, it's just nothing but uh, bobcats everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> of course, uh, that's a fun detail that we sort of passed up at the beginning. Um, another thing to mention at the beginning is the interesting like opening two sequence, uh, seconds where it tries to do this sort of like fake out and it's like... Are we in the jungle again? No. We're in the concrete jungle yeah. of L.A. <laughs> We're in L.A., baby. And, uh, yeah. And it's like, oh, you got me, movie. <laughs> yeah. See, that's another thing. It blows its wad before it has a fucking chance to... See, you say it blows its wad. For me, it's just that this movie tries to lean into being just like a trashy exploitation action movie. Which the first Predator wasn't, which, uh, I don't know. So it's different. So it's different. But they can't make the same movie again. I know, but... Quality <laughs> is what I'm more concerned about. I don't know. I Although think we they did do start this movie and notice it at a 30% on Rotten Tomatoes, which... 
listen, I don't like this movie. I don't think it deserves that, though. Come on. I mean, that's fucking ridiculous. Reaper the Genetic Opera has a 33 on Rotten Tomatoes. This is better than Reaper the Genetic Opera. Let's not get ahead of ourselves, but uh, it doesn't deserve a 33. Most movies are better than Reaper the Genetic Opera. I wouldn't go that far. It's true. Not every movie can be Death Wish 3. I'm sorry. Did he literally land in a pile of guacamole? Looks like it. (laughs) Or is he bleeding guacamole? This is movie taking the stereotypes to a new level. (laughs) That's so weird. I never noticed that. Oh, here we have this guy from Home Alone. The man who sings opera. Do you remember that, Max? No. He sings opera to Sloth, and then, like, Sloth starts screaming. Have we talked about the Goonies on the show? Oh, you said Home Alone. Oh. I was like, what the fuck are you talking oh, he's about? <laughs> he's not in Home Alone, as far <laughs> as I know. Um, I th- like, I'm just like, oh, was he part of, like, John Candy's weird fucking <laughs> polka band? Is that what you're talking about? <laughs> and they start about? singing opera. <laughs> I'm like, is that, just, did he mistake <laughs> opera for polka? Is that, I was doing oh, a man. complete search in my brain. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just imagining John Candy singing opera. <laughs> <laughs> no, my mistake, Home Alone. No, I, or uh, the Goonies. <laughs> I'm not a huge fan of the Goonies, honestly. The Goonies is overrated for sure. Now, Max, this is important. We just saw the helicopter land, and we see the feds come out in their embarrassing outfits and their big glasses. It's Gary Busey <laughs> being Gary Busey. Yep. Um, his first movie after his motorcycle accident, I think. Hmm. So potentially the origin. Of crazy Gary. Oh, I thought you were going to say the origin of Quigley. And Quigley. Because <laughs> things are not separated from one another. Um, so uh, an interesting point in that moment when the helicopter arrives is that this movie is scored by Alan Silvestri, who also did the music for the first movie. And if you watch this movie with the sound on, you're going to hear a very interesting musical cue as that helicopter arrives. And it is the same cue that you hear the protagonist cue throughout the first movie. Right. And what is the first movie? It's about a team of federal government commandos uh, going abroad into Colombia or Panama, some Central American, uh, South American country and fucking around doing something, question mark. And uh, basically that cue in my mind is meant to denote like the presence of the feds arriving. You know? Yeah. Sorry. The Jamaican voodoo posse has just been mentioned. For the first time. And I mentioned I do like things about this. Uh, One thing that will sell me on a movie is having voodoo aesthetics in it. I thoroughly love it. I always try to approach it with caution because it can be done incredibly racist. And sometimes I feel this movie is a little eh with it. But the instead of just having like a boring gang that's just like, oh, we sell drugs and shoot people. Like they have like this gang that has adopted voodoo occultism in order to intimidate their rivals and gain a complete foothold over a certain trade in the area. And I'm just like, I like that. It's fun world building. And it's like, okay, it makes it more interesting than just like, okay, these people are shooting at these people and we say there's drugs involved. Cool. Yeah. You have, you have, you have a little, little bit of flavor. I like it. Yeah. But unfortunately it doesn't pay off as much as I would like it to. No, and potentially there's a version of this movie if we were to rewrite it that could capitalize on that more, I think. Yes. Um, but the, the, I guess the point I was trying to make about the music too, just to finish that, is that I think it's interesting how that cue change happens where in the first movie it's a protagonist cue, but now it's the antagonist cue. These, these federal agents are the antagonists clearly in this movie. Um, and I think it this movie has a much more um, cynical position on the federal government than the first one, which Carl Weathers in that one, you know, there's the whole thing where he like lies to Arnold Schwarzenegger to get them to basically unwittingly perform a political assassination. Yeah. Um, under the guise of rescuing hostages. Uh, and, but, but at the end, the movie allows him some space to kind of like try to redeem himself before he gets sliced in half by the predator. This movie is completely different. I mean, Gary Busey is just complete fucking asshole. The other interesting thing about Gary Busey... Oh, also his character in the movie is a complete fucking asshole. I don't know if Gary Busey's an asshole in real life. I just know he's kind of weird. He's a fucking weirdo. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but um, 
the other the other interesting thing about Gary Busey's character and his agents, Max, is you're talking about racial stereotypes of King Willie and like the voodoo gang, right? Yes. Well, there's another stereotype at play here with the federal agents. And we learn later that Gary Busey's character graduated from Cornell. And the federal agents are frat bros from an Ivy League school. Yeah. Look at the way they're dressed. They're wearing like fucking polo Ralph Lauren <laughs> collared shirts uh, with these weird ass like fucking thick goggle glasses and like pullover vests. Well, and- like before Bill Paxton joins the squad in the next scene, the squad is entirely made up of minorities, which is interesting. And it makes Gary Busey and his gang of <laughs> Sigma Pi Alpha DEA agents. Ligma Pi. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, stand even more out of place, which is why <laughs> I like Bill Paxton. He's a fun actor. It's just I compared him to Shane Black's character in the first Predator movie of just like the goofy, annoying person who's just like, what What are you doing here? Although he is more effective than Shane's Black, <laughs> Shane Black's character in the first Predator. Yeah, you can't that. help but love Bill Paxton. Because he's just so he's just like a dumb dog. And I mean that in the best way possible. <laughs> Bill Paxton's the fucking best. He's he's honestly amazing. Um, and I love that he's in this movie. I know it obviously makes the movie feel kind of uh, derivative of Aliens, and this will not be the first time that we say that. Um, but uh, I I think it works. I think it's it's a good move. As um, somebody who does not like James Cameron overall. You, you mean? Yeah. Um, Because, like, Aliens is just Alien again, but an action movie this time. Yeah. I still like Aliens better than I like this movie, though, and it it is contradicting what I said, where it's like, make the same movie better or do something different, but good. Because, like, I don't think Aliens is a distinct enough of its own movie like it is the same thing over and I prefer the original alien completely, but I, I don't know. I, I just, I'm trying to reflect on it. Cause I don't think that's like too dramatic to say that aliens is better than this movie. Aliens is a kick-ass movie. No, I'm not saying like, that's a controversial statement. I'm like trying to work out my reasoning in my brain. Why it is. I think it's a, it's a definitely a better made movie. I mean, you, you can't, deny, I mean, James Cameron has a lot of flaws as a filmmaker, but I think he does have a very tight control of like pacing and, and he, he did, does have a certain he did type have of a vision. Heyday. Yeah. He has a certain vision that he can help bring to the screen. And I, and you know, you know, I, I think aliens does have some really great moments and it has a really solid lead performance. I like Danny Glover in this. He's not quite the same level of Sigourney Weaver in aliens though. Of course not. Um, the script doesn't just, it just doesn't give him those moments, you know? But I do think he's great in this movie doing what he needs to do. Do you have a favorite James Cameron movie, by the way? Um, now that we're on the topic. I like The Abyss. I don't think it's my favorite by him, though. Um, probably T2. I know that's a stereotypical answer. Really? Yeah, but like... It's the least offensive of his movies for me. I don't know. I feel like T2 is the beginning of the end for I mean, him. It is, but also it's, it's a solid movie on its own. I mean, it, Yeah, it definitely has solid stuff. I like everything with Joe Morton in that movie. Everything with Joe Morton in that, that movie is fucking great. Um, but I don't know. I think it's a little bit too cutesy and schmaltzy in certain areas. And it's borderline like I hate children. So you can't tap into those instincts and have too many kid moments in your movie. Otherwise, I'm going to hate it. I know that's a me problem. Uh, but, you know, I just hate children. Get them out of it my does, face. It does have, like, an R-rated Spielbergian vibe. Yeah, that movie. yeah. yeah. Um, I would say my favorite is probably Terminator or, or Aliens. Terminator is just such a, like, tight, lean movie. I don't know. Terminator is great. Now, Max, here's a scene that I get the impression you would want elaborated upon. Yes. A little bit more than just this moment. In well, the they do explain it of like the 
listen, it's not about money and it's not even about the actuality of this voodoo ritual. It's convincing. It's convincing everybody else of this stuff. Yeah. It's almost like they're performing a ritualistic killing, um, not for magic, but to like, it's like creating magic in the mind of people. Yes. Um, to when you have make an impression on them, it's like making a tulpa. Do you know what that is, Max? Yeah, see, even they're laughing at it. Fucking voodoo magic, man. (laughs) Yeah. You get the impression that King Willie's the only one who necessarily believes in any of this And it doesn't save him or help him either. No. They spend so much time building up to King Willie in this movie, and he has a great introduction scene, and then he's dead. He's also a great actor. King Willie, I wanted to save this for later, but King Willie is played by a man named Calvin Lockhart, which also, I didn't realize it until yesterday, Max, there might be some meta casting. How so? He was in an amicus movie in 1974 that participates in what I will loosely be calling the manhunt genre. And that movie is called The Beast Must Die. It's a very stupid but very fun werewolf movie. Okay. Um, but it's interesting because he, the language he uses in that movie, he's very much a macho alpha male guy. He's this wealthy black man in like the UK. And one thing he talks about is like, I had to claw my way to the top. No one gave me anything. I'm an alpha male. You know, like the world is a jungle and I'm the most dangerous man. And uh, the premise of the movie is that he invites all these people. It's kind of a murder mystery. He invites all these people to his house because he's like, one of you is a werewolf and I'm going to hunt you. Okay. And uh, that's that's a premise for a movie. <laughs> it's very silly. However, that manhunt theme is still at play. And I think that's something you can relate to the predator. Maybe. I don't know. Maybe. Somebody in the casting was a fan of that. It It's possible. Yeah. You see, I, one thing that I also don't like, I feel like the predator would have let them finish that ritual killing before he decided to slaughter all of them. Well, they did. They stabbed the guy. He's dead. Didn't look, I don't know. It looked like they were going to do something more elaborate, but yeah. Oh, maybe they weren't done, but he is dead. Yeah. yeah. Um, but now that we're on the topic of manhunt movies, I think it's a, I was thinking about this. It's actually kind of like an interesting thing to look at. And this movie, I think kind of more so than the first one plays with a legacy of that type of movie. Um, I definitely having Calvin Lockhart from the beast must die is one potential source in which it is playing with that. But I also think it is, it's doing a number of things. Uh, we're seeing Bill Paxton right now punch um, Sil- what's his face Morton Downey or whatever. Silence the media. <laughs> he's he's got him on his knees and he's basically choking him until he passes out. Um, but something that I think has changed in like this manhunt genre of movies, Max, since the start of the '80s, is the idea of like it being televised entertainment. I think one of the first big movies to do that is a movie from the '60s. Uh, from Italy with Marcello Mastriani called uh, The Tenth Victim. Did they just reuse the sci-fi door set <laughs> it's on the Predator ship and just like, hey, it's a penthouse thing now. Uh, is- this is a cool house, Max. I don't know what you're talking cool, about. It is cool, but like, come on. It doesn't, it doesn't fit, is what I'm saying. I can buy the stone pillars or whatever, but even that's a little. There's not a lot of furniture. There's a bed. Yeah. And a bunch of windows. <laughs> Girl came up here and was just like, you didn't haven't bought any furniture? At you least your bed isn't on the ground. Yeah, at least you're you doing have a, bed a good frame. job. <laughs> <laughs> well, your mom's proud of you, I'm sure. You know what, Max? I'm gonna say that's the best bed we've seen in a movie since the prince's bed from Donkey Skin. Um, I I I can't remember a better bed, so I'm gonna agree with you. Yeah. We still haven't encountered a better chair than the king's chair from Duncan. I don't know if we ever will. Seriously, can you think of a better chair off the top of your head? Not really, no. It's so distinctive. It's just a weird fucking cat thing. I think it's offensive to even try. Don't even try to think of a better one. You're not going to find one. (laughs) Now I'm thinking of a predator hunting like an alien cat that's like huge and then sitting on it like a throne. That'd be great.
So what were we talking about? We were just talking about something and I forget. You interrupted to talk about how the door looked dumb. Are you happy now? Yes, I'm incredibly happy. I was talking about... Oh, I was talking about the Manhunt movies. Yes. Okay, yeah, yeah. So a development that happens after the uh, 10th victim comes out in the 60s and then moving out through, um, I want to say, throughout the 70s and stuff like Rollerball and then going into stuff like The Running Man, et cetera, et cetera, is the idea that this this sort of Manhunt genre, the most dangerous game type plot, becomes a televised entertainment event. And this movie also picks up that thread. We This movie is interspersed with... Uh, so many uh, cutaways to like sleazy reporters uh, just trying to like get the scoop on all this violence that's occurring, all these gang battles with the cops. Um, and I feel like that's one of the areas too where like if this movie was directed by Paul Verhoeven as it was supposed to be, not in real life, but like this movie is, its destiny was to be made by Paul Verhoeven and it it missed out somehow. Um then I think that stuff would have had more of a presence, you know? And Michael Ironside would be in this movie, and that would have been cool. I mean, Michael Ironside improves everything that he's in. Yeah, it would be cool. I mean, Gary Busey, I think, does a good job in this, but if Paul Verhoeven was making this movie with Danny Glover, you know Michael Ironside would be Gary Busey's character, and it would be fucking cool. It would be great. It's been a while since we did Turbo Kid, but he was by far the standout role in that movie. We got to do like a prime era Michael Ironside. We do. Movie. I'd be down for that. Do you want to do scanners? 100% I'd love to do scanners. That would be hard. It would be, but we'd at least get a glorious head explosion. That's why it's hard. Cuz you know, it's hard to do any movie where you know you're seeing the best thing that's ever been filmed in a movie. You know what I'm saying? Whenever a movie is done like this is the best any movie has ever done this one thing, that's a hard movie to cover. There's a lot of pressure to cover that and do it justice. And you can't do justice to that head explosion because it's amazing. It escapes words. And if you donate to our Patreon, I will also make Max's head explode just like that. You have to get up to $15 if you want the video <laughs> recording. Though. Yeah, $15. Otherwise, if you just set the $10 subscription fee, you only get the audio recording. 15 <laughs> is when you get the video of it. Now, Max, I want to ask you, do, what do you think this movie's... Uh, hmm. This is something I wanted to bring up earlier based on our conversation about whether or not it would lean more into being a crime movie. Um, and I feel like if it leaned more into that, it would have a more identifiable sense of politics um, because I feel like this movie has some very contradictory political elements and subtext to it. Um, but what do you think of the way this movie treats like these cops? I mean, it does the thing that every cop centric movie does where it's just like feel sympathetic for them. They are obviously the good guys in this situation. Anybody who disagrees with that is either a criminal themselves, corrupt themselves or too stupid to realize it. But it's one. This is the far distant future of 1997 where the this entire city is on fire and people are shooting at each other the entire time. And like, we don't really get to see civilians until after the predator has fully entered the equation. Yeah. Like we see them on the subway and in a comical scene where they all pull out guns when somebody tries to rob. That's somebody. the closest this becomes a Paul Verhoeven movie. Yes. Yeah. I love that scene. That is the one good joke in the entire movie. <laughs> honestly, that's the one time I laugh out loud. <laughs> it's movie. pretty good. But <laughs> it doesn't interrogate it at all no it doesn't it, it's almost a similar approach to con air where it raises questions and then just is like la 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 blah 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 that and also we know the man isn't cool so we're gonna have the feds stop in and the feds are gonna take the role of the man see except i think it puts more thought into like the federal government being corrupt and bad oh yeah but Are that you... it uses these like most movies have more thought put yeah. into them than con air did but... yeah i but it also like you said it has that like canned like good cop 
protagonist thing and it doesn't i feel like it's not entirely sure what to do with that you know um but it does result in an ending that i think is kind of pessimistic about like policing it's like everyone around him is dead and like nothing has changed and you know that some other cornell ivy league asshole is going to be hunting the predator next you know, like n- nothing has happened. Not if they weaponize autism quickly enough. <laughs> We're not going to bring up the, <laughs> the, the Predator 2018 movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for I've all- never seen that, but like I just remember today after you told me like that it's the plot hinges on autism or or something, and it's just like nope, nope. Sorry, <laughs> I can just sorry. Can't do Sh- that. Shane Black's writing was great in the eighties. Um, hasn't hasn't aged that well, unfortunately. And also, it's like just as stupid and offensive as the autism. Frankly, Max, is you told me that they're the predators are like global warming is bad. Yeah, that's just as stupid. What one predator wants to save that's us from so global bad. warming, and the other one wants to oh kill us. Oh my god, that's so terrible. Global, for, yeah, for creating global warming. I hate that so much. No, that's like, and that's an interesting thing about the Predator is, is like, I'm going to put a nickel in the jar of Max talks about Star Trek, but like, it's, it's hilariously entertaining to me of like the idea of just like high minded Star Trek people interacting with the Predators. <laughs> Cause like they're these super advanced race. They've mastered faster than light travel. And all they do is go to lesser developed worlds and hunt things for sport where they're totally barbaric and, but not in a, I don't know, a barbaric, the Predators are very ritualistic. Much, yeah, ritualistic is what I would say, not barbaric. Um, well, I would say that they're evil. Yeah. They're like, that's the thing that these two movies hammer home is that the predators don't care about Earth. What the fuck are you talking about? They're not like Native Americans. They have a code, but it's more just a warrior's code. Like they don't kill pregnant people. And if you challenge them to a one-on-one duel, they won't just shoot your head off with a plasma cannon. But the, the reason they don't kill pregnant women is not noble. The reason they don't kill pregnant women. No, it's women, a hunter's code. Yeah. It's like, this isn't, you're not, you're not like a good enough repository for me to turn into like a fucking trophy. No, it's not even that. It's, I, I, I've always interpreted it as like, you don't kill like does during like like after mating season if you're a hunter just because like you want to keep the population stable so i always thought it was like that either way it, yeah it is reminiscent of like it's not like a honor thing it's like a no we you you don't kill this because yeah they have a code but it's yeah. an evil code yes. it's it's horrifying you know and every decision they make is like this weird uh horrifying double of humanity and the thing that defines them more than anything else is their sadism and their maliciousness. They don't just like hunting people. They're, like we're talking about, they just killed Ruben Blades, poor Ruben Blades. Um, very interesting actor, by the way. Um, and when they when uh, Danny Glover stops at his grave later, we're going to see the Predator for no reason decides to antagonize Danny Glover and fuck with him by putting Ruben Blades' uh, necklace on a tree for him to see it. Yeah. You know, they're sadistic and they're like evil psychopaths. They don't care about nature. And that's also <sighs> introduces a point that I hate where like you see like because the boy accidentally bumps into the predator. And the the predator like hears him say just like want some candy. And then he plays that back. So I'm fine with the Predators doing that. Like, they have their helmets, and the helmets can, like, pick up language and then, like, capture audio and play it back in order to trick people. I'm fine with that. It's when later in the movie we learned they can speak perfect English. I'm just like, this is fucking dumb. I hate this. So that relates to... No, I, it doesn't relate to anything. Oh, you're just lodging a complaint. Yes. I see. I see. I, I know that's supposed to be a big... Just whining, Just I a suppose. big sting moment at the end of it when Danny Glover's like, you are one ugly, and the predator goes, motherfucker! Don't it's, you suppose you're being a little bit of a Karen to no. say that? Asking for the manager of this movie, because uh, there's a... Because uh, what? Was there, you, you got the wrong sandwich? What's up? Huh? No. <laughs> what the fuck are you talking about? I'm just trying to dismiss your criticism. <laughs> No, that is a stupid moment. I I understand. Um, But basically, this is all just to say that the 2018 one, even though I haven't seen it, seems incredibly stupid. Yeah, it is. I don't understand why you try to, like, make the Predator, like, a woke, like, fucking... It's not even that, though, because, like, 
you just, can't you can't call it woke because one like there's the whole autism thing but also like you have lines in it of just like yeah man you can't say the word retarded his fucking son's retarded and i'm just like it's edge boy humor like that mixed with global warming messages mixed with a hilarious level of misunderstanding autism it's just like it appeals to no one it's, it's magical just conf- it's just it's just ugh, fuck it i don't know what to say about it <laughs> i'm not gonna watch it don't it's not worth it but this is all to say also that i think something that this movie has taught me is that the predator belongs in stories about the u.s government committing malicious acts it's something we'll see later with Gary Busey giving the exposition finally to uh, uh, Danny Glover about what it is, is he's talking about, he's listing different locations, right? About where the predator, we assume they have tracked the predator showing up, right? So they're saying like Cambodia, Beirut. Uh, I think he mentions like two more, but they're all places that are like, oh man, did the U.S. intervene there in some horrible way and some like, disgusting like military action that the u.s public was like mostly unaware of or like in some manufacturing consent way basically didn't understand the situation at all um and it's like yeah probably and uh i think that's interesting i like i think it's interesting if i was to rewrite this movie or write another predator movie to take up the mantle of this one I would almost explore the idea that the predators didn't start showing up on planet earth until like the fucking U S existed and started causing like the most amount of violence on a global scale of like any country in history. Right. I mean, the U S is the most globally violent country. It makes sense that the predators would show up in these violent areas that the U S often destabilizes with commando squads like Arnold Schwarzenegger. Not him personally. But yeah. That we know of. Just other muscly men who oil each other up and fuck each other in the ass at night. Hey, it's an ancient Spartan ritual. It's not gay <laughs> if you're warriors. It's not gay. It's like, it's like you know, teenagers doing the haka before a football game. It's not gay. It's cool. Here we have this man operating a video production switcher that's actually supposed to be a video production thing though is it though i guess they have cameras set up yeah but what is he switching between nothing he just has the cameras set up i mean nobody in these movies actually knows how to use this equipment so they just start hitting buttons and flipping switches and you don't know that the director probably is like this is a video production switcher actor you're gonna be a technical director Yeah, they're probably just like, yeah, push some buttons. It looks fine. It's a cool, you know, van or whatever. Stop complaining. I like the, we have this NCIS (laughs) fucking ass lady. Yeah, this, this woman is so random. Just this random, like, old woman that they all decide to, like, bring this previously undiscovered metal object to. If I was this woman, I would try to steal this. Be like, this is my ticket to a Nobel Prize. Yeah. (laughs) This is previously undiscovered. This is several previously undiscovered elements. Or I would sell it to L. Ron Hubbard for like a billion dollars, and then he would use it to prove the existence of like whatever the fuck. Who who's their guy? Ah, whatever. I don't know. That joke wasn't worth it. It's not worth it to even think about for two seconds. Nothing on the periodic table. There's not even carbon in it. Nothing. Nothing. (laughs) Uh, I don't know. I love this car, by the way. You can say what you want about Jamaican stereotypes. This car is amazing. Oh, no. I I love it. It might be kind of tacky, but it's perfect. I would get a zebra print car if I could. Are you kidding me? It's amazing. amazing. (laughs) It's amazing. You would get so many tickets, but it is amazing. 
So if you could afford oh, it's zebra print and gold, come on, <laughs> come on, yes. who wouldn't like that car? And it has Christmas lights, and it has a, it has zebra print interior as well. <laughs> yeah, it's perfect. It's perfect. Oh man, if you could afford all the tickets, you would get from it. And if you could afford how many people would fucking key your car at like the gym or whatever, then go for it. Go for it. Get that car. This is a pretty interesting scene. I I find the cinematography in this movie to be deceptively simple or deceptively compelling. I'll say. I think there's a few shots in here or there where that are kind of they feel very reminiscent to me of like a, a expressionist composition of this city. One of them is coming up in this alleyway. We get this very weird shot of Danny Glover, and it's like you know a low, a very low angle shot with his like face up against the side of the building. And it just looks kind of bizarre. Another shot uh, that reminds me of like an expressionist pro- approach to creating the city setting is when Ruben Blades is going to examine the crime scene and does that weird sort of like camera move where it's, you know, high above. This is the shot I'm talking about, by the way, um, where it's high above him and you get all this bizarre geometry and the shadows sort of moving together and then sort of pulls into him going into the elevator. Do you think King Willie really wanted to meet by the back of the dry ice factory for a reason? Or? It looks cool. Shut up. <laughs> Shut the fuck up. I just wish they had let it disperse across the ground a little bit more. Here we have Calvin Lockhart as King Willie. He is great. He's cool. Yeah. No, and they spend the first, but yet again, I, I love the build up to him. I love the aesthetics of the gang. I love the flavor it provides it, but... King really, unfortunately, doesn't have great payoff. You know what, Max? The more you say that, the more I I like this movie more than you, but I also wish that this... Honestly, Max, I wish this was like a three-hour crime epic. Yeah. I could totally live with that. Or have King Willie live longer. Have that be a, be a running theme of just like we're gonna we're gonna need criminal resources in order to team up to fight the predator yeah and i think that's something to do with the confused politics of this movie because i think this is where it gets to the idea of like the predator being something like symptomatic of like um the evil that the u.s perpetrates abroad and on its own citizens um i think this is his monologue king willie's monologue that he's about to offer this thing that's killing your people and mine right it it's like the predator is emblematic of like a cycle of violence itself you know it's drawn to violence it only arrives when there's this type of violence so it requires a cycle of violence like this in order to be attracted to the setting um and that ties it to the u.s because the u.s is so good at destabilizing certain areas and ensuring that violence continues in order for things to remain the same Right. Yeah. And as you said, Gary Busey later on will mention other places that the U.S. has done that. Yes. And uh, again, obviously, this makes you reflect on the first movie and you realize, oh, shit, that's absolutely what those commandos were doing in what, whichever South American country they were in. Um, Until Alien versus Predator just shits all over ugh. The, We can talk later about how that ruins the Predators and the mistakes that w- were made there. Um but I guess the thing that I find most interesting about this, do you know what the um, frontier thesis is or the uh, turn it, Turner thesis, I think it's called is? Uh, I've heard of the Turner thesis. I don't. It's this idea that like this um, historian who was like a liberal humanist racist um, it, about a hundred plus years ago in like 1890 when the frontier was officially closed, he was kind of, he wrote this famous like essay about like what the frontier meant in the like, um, sociology and the character of the American people and how important it was. Um, and the idea that just because the physical frontier is gone doesn't mean that the frontier will like may necessarily disappear in the minds and hearts of Americans. And um, he was right about that, but the reason he was racist and shitty is because he was bemoaning that and he thought it was like the frontier is like a thing that drives opportunity and not like a fucking engine for genocide on an unbelievably vast scale. Um, And uh, in the 20th century, where does that frontier go? It goes to the sort of like uh, imperialist realm, right? Oh, we get a, I didn't even notice that. What? That we get a continuation of the first movie. 
What do you mean? Because uh, in the first movie, we had, uh, what's his name, Billy, the Native American tracker, who challenged him to a one-on-one duel. Yep. And Billy also got his head ripped off and got his skull taken as a trophy. Yes. Yes. And, uh, yeah. Oh. Uh, basically, the point I'm trying to make is that Sorry. something that I think happens when, something that is talked about when empires start to falter and fail is that the frontier comes home. Right. So the idea is that, um, yeah, the, the way empires treat the marginalized far out communities on that frontier that they're exploiting and conquering, um, comes home and that's how they treat their own citizens when they have to start maintaining order because things are falling apart. Right. Um, so that's something about this movie, and it relates completely to the first movie with, I think, the war on drugs, and that was something that we've talked about in other episodes, too. The idea of the 90s being like the end of history, and, you know, we finally beat the communist Soviet Union. Capitalism has won. There's no more enemies to defeat. So now we have to invent them. Yes, we have to invent them. Uh, we're going to start the war on drugs. We're going to hype up, you know, super predators and gang violence, right? Um but of course, uh, the war on drugs becomes this fabricated thing that the government is entirely involved in and less interested in like, you know, trying to end drug trade or anything so much as manipulate it to gain, you know, political favor on a more um, international scale, you know? Um, so it has nothing to do with protecting people or anything. It, it's all about power. And I just find that interesting because to have this movie set in a city 10 years after the first one and have the city be kind of falling apart in this way, I think you can definitely definitely look at this sort of broad view of urban decay as kind of like a racist trope, I think. Um, the idea of like the city is overwhelmed and like sinking and, um, you know, full of minorities, so to speak. Um, I think that's kind of a racist trope. But also another way to potentially look at it is that like, it's it's like this because it's like a, a a symptom of failing empire, right? And the idea that the the sort of federal government is now treating it's one of its own cities as like a concert uh, conquered area, and is willing to destabilize it in order to gain further technology to further their control over everything else. It doesn't listen to them instantly. I think this moment is kind of stupid, to be honest. Yes, I completely agree. Um, also, the fact that in this city, a couple would let their kid have a toy gun <laughs> and just wander around with it. Uh, I mean, in this city, it's surprising that this kid doesn't have a real gun, yeah. first of all. As um, we learn later. <laughs> yeah. But also, like I, like, I guess they felt the need. This feels like a producer's note, to be honest. You know, we got to show that the Predator... Doesn't kill everyone on site. Yes. She's not going to kill this kid. What I really wish it was is that the car- the predator only revealed itself partially to the kid, not because it had a gun, but because it just wanted to scare the shit out of the kid. <laughs> That's what I wish it was. It's like, use this as an opportunity like to make I the predator s- mean. Like I said, I, I think it's more of a hunter thing where it's like, no, you don't kill the unarmed young. You don't kill the childbearing mothers. You want to keep the population stable so you can keep <laughs> hunting things that could actually kill you. No, of course that's what it is. Yeah. I'm just saying that if I was rewriting the scene, I would say, you know, don't have the kid holding a gun. Have the predator just decide to scare the kid, even though it's not going to kill him just yeah. for its own amusement. Because that's what it's doing here anyway is to fuck with Danny Glover. It has no interest in killing Danny Glover right now, although I'm sure it could. Danny Glover doesn't know it's there. It could just, like, shoot him with its laser laser cannon. But it's not interested in that. It's sadistic. It's mean. For some reason. Well, I think the reason being is that it's, like, it's kind of like a reflection of what, at least in the first movie, I think something they capture really well is that the Predator is a reflection of everything these commandos are, except it's better at everything they do than they are which they have never encountered in their lives. They've never met something that's more efficient and effective at killing than they are. They've never met a force that's more, like, terrifying than they are. But then they do. 
and the predator knows that it's better than they are. So it lords it over them, it taunts them, it teases them, it tries to like uh, make them crack mentally, which actually works with Bill Duke. Uh, after it kills Jesse Ventura. <laughs> I will say that's a clear advantage that uh, the first movie has over this one, is that this movie has no governors in it. First one had two. First one had two, and it nearly had three, because Sonny Landham also ran for governor once. I think of Kentucky. Could be wrong about that, though. So it almost had three governors, Max. That's amazing. Oh, my God. Jesse Ventura. <laughs> Jesse the body. No, he's the, he's the mind now. Well, he's dead. <laughs> he's the corpse. <laughs> Jesse the corpse, Ventura. Is he dead? I, I didn't think so. <laughs> I just assume that everyone from a movie in the 80s is dead. I know he's old as hell. Yeah. A the best joke in the movie. <laughs> yeah, the little grandma is the thing that gets me. That feels like it's out of a fucking Paul Verhoeven movie. That's what I'm saying. So much of this movie is like just waiting for, for Paul Verhoeven. And I think without his touch, you know, I, I think it suffers a little bit. I think they do a good job, though. Good enough job without the inspiration of a Paul Verhoeven. Which, by the way, Max, talk about things that are hyped up that I am... I'm so excited, but so cautiously nervous about Paul Verhoeven's upcoming nunsploitation movie. Oh my God. I am so excited to see that. Yeah. I, I can't see anything wrong with that. I, I hope, I hope, I hope, but it has been so many, not just Paul Verhoeven, but so many filmmakers have been trying to adapt that novel for like 30 years, which I understand why it's been hard. Cause it's nunsploitation. It's not a, yeah. exactly an easy thing to get people to agree to make, but uh, I just hope it's like a George Miller situation where he just comes back and is just like. Did you ever see L? Uh, no, I have not. That it, he hasn't lost his edge at all. <laughs> okay, good. I can understand people not liking that movie, but it has edge to it. There's no doubt. Also, Isabel Huppert. We got to do an Isabel Huppert movie, Max. She's one of the best. Sorry, you got me in a Verhoeven mood now. I want to do another one of his movies. We did oh, do, absolutely. We did do Starship Troopers, though, which is utter classic. Utter classic. It is a classic. Maybe we could do um, a lesser seen Verhoeven movie. Yeah, I'd be down. Because I was going to say, like, we both know that we love Robocop, and we don't need to say anything about that or the sequels. But Yeah. The also good sequel, Robocop 2. Yes, not yeah. 3. <laughs> 3 I haven't seen. Did they recast in three? They got, yeah, they recast. Ca got rid of Peter Waller. It was three was like the movie for like when you knew about Robocop, but hadn't seen it and you were a kid and wanted to watch a Robocop movie. Oh, was it, it kid friendly? Yeah, it was like designed to sell oh, toys man. and like it, it, yeah, it just completely threw everything that the first. It's the same problem with wanted. AVP, to be honest with you. Yeah. As, at least as far as the predators are concerned. The aliens in that one are still. You know, they're aliens. Good. No, you have yeah. you have a good looking alien queen and a good look at one of the yeah, good looking alien props. Yeah, I mean, as far as um, you know, the props and shit go, at least in that first movie from two thousand four, they kind of look okay. Yeah. You I know, mean, the entire movie's very dark, so they can hide some things, but Yeah, but it's like, you know, it's guys rest wrestling around in suits and it's like this kind of looks okay, but they make the predators too nice. Yeah. And it's stupid. Predators are not fucking nice. We need to get this idea out of our heads. Otherwise, we're never going to get real Predator movies again. Oh, sorry. We're never getting real Predator movies again because it's owned by Disney. Yeah. Whoops. Bum, 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 bum. But that sucks ass. Do we want to talk about the AVP movies in general? Because something I did want to bring up is, although I would say that like, because <laughs> I don't like this movie, but I like predators as just like a fun sci-fi movie empty head fun well-made sci-fi movie and i of course predator one is great so i would say there are two solid predator movies um which is a higher percentage <laughs> of good movies in the franchise than alien has um because there are infinitely more alien movies unfortunately 
but I, w- I was thinking, are there more, there's not, I don't think there are good, more good alien movies because <laughs> you have alien and aliens and then alien uh, three is a great movie. It is good. It is good. Um, alien resurrection is stupid. The early resurrection is fucking bad. Um, it's stupid. Yeah. It, not even Brad to riff can save that movie. Although um, I, d- I, d- I would watch a super cut with his scenes in it. So he, he's like crying to the alien and he's like, mommy, eat me. So That's I, need, great. I need to clarify my next statement that I'm about to make. I liked Prometheus, but I think I've mentioned this on the show before. I liked Prometheus because I went into it not knowing it was an alien se- like an alien continuation and thought it was just a standalone sci-fi movie by Ridley Scott. And I enjoyed it up until the part I realized it was an alien <laughs> sequel. And I'm just like, oh, that's kind of dumb. We didn't need to do this. But I, I liked it up until then. Um, I think both the, those movies are better than fucking Alien Resurrection, to be honest with you. But uh, Alien Covenant, no. Uh, Prometheus, I will say, is bad, better than Alien Resurrection. But it, yeah. Covenant, no. Ridley's- you didn't like the thing where he was playing the flute to himself? <laughs> Aspender. Uh, sometimes, he's, sometimes he's an amazing actor, and sometimes I'm just like, what the fuck are you doing there, man? Come on. <sighs> All I know is that those movies, I don't really consider them to be alien movies, frankly. Um, they're kind of just like, I don't know. They're, they're old man sitting on the toilet thinking movies. There's there's actual intellectual stuff going on in those movies. Um, like with Prometheus, he's talking about the creation of aliens, but he's also trying to, through a bunch of intertextual references, um, construct an idea of like, what created the alien. So there's like shots that reference movies like planet of the vampires, which is weird. Um, and, and stuff like queen of blood, which is interesting, but I, I don't know if I like Prometheus. I just, I don't know. I don't know how I feel about it. I don't know anymore. All I know is that like, can we please get a real predator movie? None of this autism I stupidity. I don't think we need another Predator movie. There are so many things that people are like, can we get another one of these? I'm just like, you know what? I'm, I'm done with the remakes. Come up with new ideas, everybody. Make 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 new interesting movies. Stop trying to reboot everything. That's fair. I get, But I accept that we're going to get a new Predator movie. So if we're going to get a new one, can we please have one where he's like murdering children again? Please. Please. Well, that's why the new uh, Halloween movie was pretty good. Where Did the, he murder kids? He literally murders a child in like the opening. In the 2018 one? <laughs> yeah. I don't remember that. Yeah, he fucking stabs the shit out of a kid on the side of the road. Um, when did that happen? Earlier on in the movie. But uh, Who? I've, <sighs> All I remember is the teeth. He kills the podcasters. Podcast, you need uh, script writers. I know. I think you think you're really cool and edi- you know, like edgy by adding podcasters to your movies now, but it's played out. That's the thing that I'm just like, oh, really? We we have a kaiju podcast and Godzilla versus oh, Kong now. God damn it! <laughs> that was the worst part of that movie. It was. I like Millie Bobby Brown as an actress, but her entire subplot was very superfluous and didn't need it to be in the yeah, movie. And I don't like her as an actor, or at least I haven't seen anything that I think is good that she's in. But I also don't watch TV, as people who listen to the show know. But if I did, I wouldn't like Stranger Things. I liked the first season. It was a nice self-contained thing. It didn't need to go on. I bet it was terrible. <laughs> well, you like Predator 2, so I don't need to <laughs> value your opinions anymore. Predator 2, they don't call anyone motherfucker or pussyface in... Uh, uh, what, what's the they might use Stranger they things. might use motherfucker because Netflix allows you to get away with that kind of shit. But okay, they don't they don't call anybody pussy face. And honestly, I think that's for the betterment of Stranger Things. I think it would be a little bit out of place. Isn't the demon got like a pussy face though? It, it is. I would say the fucking monsters design is one of the laziest part of Stranger Things. It's just why do they do that? Why do they give monsters vagina faces? Aren't we done with that? I don't know. I think it's it's. I I blame J.J. Abrams. I feel like he. I mean, I I don't know what you're. Well, I mean, it's James Cameron's fault that the Predator has a vagina face in the first place. So, you know that story, right? Yeah, but also like it works for the Predator. It works for the Predator. It should have stopped there. 
Nothing else. We, we have to stop doing this. It'd be far more disturbing for something to have a penis face. Can you agree? Well, that's how you get raw head Rex. That's a penis head, not a penis <laughs> face. That's a key difference. Fuck you. At least Rawhead the, Rex, Max, say the, what you want about that movie. At least they had the balls to fucking kill a kid in that movie. True. I do like the theory that um, <laughs> the only reason Clive Barker directed Hellraiser is because he saw how Rawhead Rex turned out. <laughs> He's like, fuck no. <laughs> We're not doing this again. Who would win in a fight? Clive Barker. <laughs> or... <laughs> No, Clive I, Barker or Stephen King. No. <laughs> well, Clive Barker, obviously. Depends on how coked out Stephen King is. Though. I don't know. I don't know. I think Clive Barker. If he's would, on it levels of cocaine, I think he's unstoppable. Clive Barker would distract him in like a gimp suit or something. <laughs> Throw a ball gag in the opposite direction. <laughs> <laughs> He'd choke Stephen King with a ball gag. Start whipping him to death. <laughs> no, I was going to ask about a uh, pinhead versus a predator. Um... I mean, if we're going, that's the thing. Because I, I was thinking about like slasher movie sequels in, yeah. in terms of this movie specifically. And like when they try to ex like over explain stuff is when it gets super bad. Like when they tried to add like weird fucking supernatural incest stuff to the Michael Meyer Halloween movies. That's when it started going off the fucking rails when they... The, they over explained the dream demons in fucking Nightmare on Elm Street when they said that Jason was a fucking weird parasite thing that lived inside <laughs> corpses. <laughs> and th that was fucking stupid. That's honestly my favorite moment in all those, though. When they're like, Freddy's, Freddy's mom was raped by a thousand maniacs or whatever. And they're like, literally, that happened. <laughs> it's like, how did that happen? A thousand times? Are you kidding me? Uh, here we have Adam Baldwin. What do you think of that, Max? Adam Baldwin. Is it one? Is he Alec Baldwin's sibling? Yeah, oh, I don't care. <laughs> For somebody who said that if you fucked with me one more time, you'd end up missing, he's really giving him a lot of chances. It's hubris. It's because he's got a huge ego. He can't help lording it over this guy. So he's like, I'm going to explain to you everything I'm doing to you. Or not doing to you, but like everything I'm about to accomplish because I'm ambitious. That's the thing that's really disturbing to me about this movie and the way it totally gets the federal government agent correct. He's an Ivy League shithead, right? And he sees this thing that is causing unbelievably, unbelievable levels of violence as like a career opportunity. You know, the predator for him is just an outlet for his ambition. And that absolutely rings true. For these fucking disgusting Ivy League uh, Jima, social Cambodia and Beirut. Yep. There you go. Damn it. Gary Busey. But uh, I yeah, I almost called him Gary Bussey. Yeah, I noticed that. <laughs> Sorry, I pride my the coming up. It's That's what people are talking about when they talk about kink at pride. Yeah. They're really talking about Gary Busey. Is people he gonna be there yes or no? Gary Bu <laughs> people talking about Gary Bussey. <laughs> yes. Yeah. All the all the miners on Twitter are like I'm gonna change my Twitter handle. <laughs> 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 Gary Bussey at Pride. Yeah. Miners, hide your eyes. If you don't want to see Gary Bussey. <laughs> I've, I, the, uh, this, we said this off recording, but my, there's the whole like, don't show kink at pride. What think of the children? And that's just like, we're really using the same neo puritanical discourse that like was used to <laughs> deny gay people their rights not even fucking 10 years ago. And now you're trying to bring it into pride. Get out of here. It's woke. Get out of here. It's woke now. Shit. It's woke. It's not woke. This is why the world should just listen to me about everything. You're right, a straight white man. With your ideas, everybody would be far better off. You know what? You wouldn't have any more kink at pride discourse. <laughs> so that's one check mark in the pro column. I think people would love it. <laughs> you guys would have a great time, I'm serious. 
Yeah. Just put me in charge. You'll we'll love see. it. I'm I'm really excited to go to Pride this year. I've been cooped up too much. I'm finally got both my shots. I'm ready to fucking go. I just produced a week long symposium of Pride events for my giant company that I work for. So I uh am tired of it already. <laughs> That's corporate pride though. That's fucking bullshit. Nothing beats like any sort of like humanity out of you, like corporations trying to genuinely be excited for things. <laughs> It's just like, uh, I like, I hate it. My favorite meme ever is still those still like <laughs> companies. The second that pride is over, it's just the evolutionary picture, the evolutionary picture of like the evolution of man. It's just later homo. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I feel like this scene could have been very tense and suspension filled if we didn't already know all these people were going to fucking die. I don't know how you fix that though. Cause you know, they're going to get fucked up the ass. Right? Yeah. I guess the way you would fix it is you try to more thoroughly integrate some part of the team. That's what I'm saying. Like you're like, talking about. Yeah. Have Gary Busey give up. He's like, okay, I didn't think that you would make it this far, but we're going to do this. We're going to do this together. Like, but also, if you do that, you give up on the really solid critique that these characters but represent. I don't, but I don't think it's a solid critique is my problem with it, though. But it might not be as solid of a critique for you in this movie, but you give up that opportunity yes. if you make them work together. Because I think there or is a definitive can, benefit or in you having can these just, characters be evil. No, you can just have a scene as soon as they go in there. It's like, sir, why did you have them go out? We've been training those forever. It's just like, well, if things go bad, then it's their asses, not ours. Have have a line like that it, it it's super simple to fix in script writing but using them as bait or something yeah 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 you, you could have a way where he has more of his team intact and they're trying to do this while also gary bussey's team is exploiting him you know yeah and it would maybe make it would maybe make them more dastardly but nonetheless, Max, I think that this entire sequence is very appropriate. Um, for I, you know, you say it's not intentional, Max, but at the same time, I think it's present in the movie because where are they located right now? Nineteen ninety-seven. Well, yes, but they're located in a slaughterhouse. Do you remember the last time a slaughterhouse appeared on the Spectator Film Podcast? Slaughterhouse Five. No, it was the movie seconds oh yeah and it was a metaphor in that movie for a, a type of like brutal violent industrialization uh that cannibalizes its own citizens and that's exactly the same thing that you could say that the slaughterhouse represents here although now it's also conflated with this idea of these people being meat for the fucking predator And I just think it works. I but, find it funny that like Predator, like, because we assumed the Predator vision is like its visor for like hunting purposes. But I find it funny that like it can't just turn off the visor and like see normally. <laughs> it has to switch through all the different Instagram filters it has on its thing before it can see something. Yeah, like we see that one moment in the first movie when it's taking off its helmet at the big climactic moment. Uh, that we see it's like true vision, but it's kind of like an inverse um, sort of thermal vision, I guess. I don't know. They don't have good eyesight. That's yeah, they, sure. have, they have tiny little BD eyes. Yeah. So it makes sense. But All I know is that I find these filters to be weirdly beautiful. I didn't know how long it took for them to come up with these different filters and then, you know, how, how to like actually make them look like that. But I think they did a really good job. I mean, that looks amazing. It does. They probably had to do all sorts of weird, like analog distortions to get that to look that way. And of course this sequence is very reminiscent of aliens scene where uh, Gorman freaks out when everyone is in the uh, reactor room or whatever, and they get attacked by the aliens for the first time and like half the people die. 
I love that moment. When Danny Glover draws his gun on that guy, you hear like an anime whoosh sound. That's so fucking loud. I was watching this last night and it made me laugh my ass off. Neither do you. Can I, this might sound stupid, Max, but can I just say I really appreciate how much this movie is like willing to use a thousand F bombs? I guess. I don't know. They don't do that in movies anymore. They don't say fuck a ton. Uh, I, I I like it when it's in a goofy movie, but like specifically the Disney goofy movie. I love I love how many times Goofy says fuck in that movie or fuck. Um, no more jokes for the rest of your <laughs> life. None. But I don't. It, it does get tedious after a fair amount. I think that's why that you don't see it as often anymore. But also Hollywood doesn't make like, I think that's why Godzilla versus Kong kind of took me off. Yeah. Guard for a little bit. Cause I'm just like, this movie is fun and stupid. And normally movie has to be either stupid or fun. We can't have both. They have all this high tech equipment, but it doesn't compare to me having a fucking gun. I just love thinking of like frat bros trying to fight a fucking predator. <laughs> so funny. To That's me. something I would watch. A- Animal House versus Predator. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! The, the dean is going to put the predator on like super <laughs> secret probation or whatever, <laughs> or whatever the fuck. The dean hires the predator to take, <laughs> <laughs> take out the frat house. The predator isn't prepared for the night of his life, and then the good frat is like, "But sir." You're, it's going to kill them. So what do I care? What's that actor's name? John Vernon, I think. Werner Herzog? I no, 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 no. He's, no, 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 no. The dean from that is the cop from Killer Clowns. Oh. Oh. He's the really good deadpan actor. He would be great in this movie. Fuck it. He'd be good in anything. Oh my god, I just remember he delivers the only scary line in all of Killer Clowns from Outer Space. We just want to kill you. He delivers that so well in that movie. Yeah, he's great. You know what I really appreciate about this movie, Max? It might seem stupid, but like they invest so much money in explosions. I was just gonna say, you always appreciate a good, well done explosion. They have a number of really good explosions. They do in this. And it's more the pyrotechnic aspect of it because you can make gigantic, huge CGI explosions in movies now. But like, even if sometimes they look a little fake and you can see where like the firework or whatever ends, it's there's nothing. Nothing beats a good practical explosion, really. Yeah. And another cool thing about this movie is how well they integrate the explosions into a space with the actors. Like even that explosion with Gary Busey, right? It's not as cool as the one that happened just before it, but like, you know, it. Uh, you, you see the actor um, Kevin Peter Hall in the Predator outfit, I'm assuming, uh, jump down right in front of it. You know, it's cool. It's good. It's a good thing to do. And also, unlike other movies, I think that they actually allow explosions to change the aesthetic. Like, this lighting is just so cool. I think this lighting alone makes this action sequence and just a lot of the creative decisions in this movie uh, a lot more compelling than you'll find in a lot of stuff today. Speaking of which, you know who another director that would have been interesting to see their take on a Predator movie uh, would have been Tony Scott. That would have been awesome. Thought you were going to say Michael Bay because of explosions in 90s directors. No, no. Maybe 90s Michael Bay. It might have been interesting. It would have been interesting. I don't know if it would have been good, but it would have been no. interesting. But Tony Scott, it might have been good. It would have been cool to see Tony Scott. Tony Scott and Paul Verhoeven. The two missing Predator movies that I, I dream about at night. Now, Max, do you, uh, what's about to happen? Do you find this realistic or interesting? 
Because I felt this was kind of lame, the way he just shoots him, to be honest. I don't... Yeah, especially since we saw, like, all of the assault rifle fire just fucking bounce off of him yeah. before. And how fucking hard it was for Arnold to kill him in that. And he, obviously, he doesn't die here. We have a whole fucking elongated chase sequence after this. You know what? This movie, if it had more ballsy politics, I think it could have done a thing where he uses, like, Gary Bussey as a distraction. That would have been that would have been a cool moment where like it's about you think because he's the good cop character that he's gonna save Gary Busey, but like instead he lets Gary Busey be like the sacrificial lamb so that he could then blow this fucking thing's like ass off. That would have been cool. The I would have just unloaded my entire fucking clip into this thing. Like I, I don't care if you think it's dead. I, I am fucking Yeah, otherwise you got twenty minutes of movie left. <laughs> I I would keep shooting this until it is nothing but a neon rave green pulp. I I am <laughs> yeah. And also, I mean little little nitpick here. How does he know how to take its mask off? Almost like he wants it to call him a motherfucker. Oh, uh, he's taking it off. See, there is a version of the scene that you could do well, where it's just like he throws the mask to the side, okay, and says you are one ugly, and then like have the mask do like a beep boop thing and just go motherfucker and have it like distract him, look around, and then the predator gets up, which preserves the fact that the predators can't speak English. You know what? It would have been cool, Max, if it used the audio from Arnold Schwarzenegger. Yes, that would have been cool. Because then it would have been like, oh, my God. But then again, I don't know if they would have had the legal rights to do that without Arnold um, signing on to the movie, you know? Or maybe they would have to pay him to do that, to use his voice. This is back in the day before when they made movies, the actors didn't sign their likeness rights away for the next 1,000 years. Yeah. I have to give props to Zelda Williams because she was very adamant on Twitter recently that she will die before she allows literally anybody to touch her father's likeness for any project whatsoever, which I've what, got to respect. Was somebody trying to like do a CGI Robin Williams? Apparently somebody had contacted for what? her. No, she didn't disclose anything about it, but apparently somebody had, yeah, numerous people had contacted her about using Robin Williams likeness or voice for things after he died. That's so disturbing. I know, right? Why did why was Peter Cushing the one guy that was like victimized by this? Because the that that like was the first big profile actor they got away with. That like wasn't like oh well they weren't in the movie but they died during it so we wanted to fil- finish some scenes that was just like no we're fucking doing this. Well yeah but why was it him? Is it just because he happened to be in Star Wars? Why did they yeah. choose him compared to someone else? He's a he's a famous actor who played a semi-famous role in star wars Mm. and i'm assuming like you said his estate is nothing but money grubbing lawyers at this point as is the case with most estates yeah so yeah they were fine with it where as like now you have actors signing stuff into their contracts saying that you can't use my likeness or if they don't have enough yeah pull that they consent to it yeah, but I'm saying like big like Tom Cruise I know has signed into a thing that you can't use his image after he dies. I don't know if it's because it like a friend offends Zenu or whatever, but um, <laughs> we'll pull his ghost soul back to Earth from his space heaven or I I don't know. But it, yeah, it's truly discussion. But I think Peter Cushing that was a, a lot at least for people in the film community to be like eh, yikes. Well, it didn't go well. I mean, I we have talked about this. We've hinted about this a lot about how Rogue One is maybe the worst Star Wars movie. Um, I, I have not seen The Rise of Skywalker because neither I, have I. I was bored of Star Wars by that point, but The Last Jedi at least had some entertaining moments in it, whether intentional or not. I laughed a lot during The Last Jedi, but Rogue One made me angry. <laughs> I was not having a good. It's time a during. fascist movie. It's a fascist, it's a pro-fascist, it's so disgusting. Well, that's the thing. It, there's an interesting th- argument to be had that, like, you can't, like, 
adopt the clearly fascist stormtrooper stuff and then disnify it and like sell stormtrooper fucking like Funko Pops and like socks to children. And it's just like, it, I know George Lucas started this shit, but like it's so far removed now where like at least the empire had like an ideology <laughs> where it's like the first order and bullshit like that. It's just like, they're, they're evil. We don't know what they want. Because I mean, say what you want about the national socialists. At least those guys had an ethos. Is that what you're telling me? No, <laughs> not an ethos, but like they were like the empire, like were Nazis because it was World right. War II in space. No. Yeah. And that's, of course, the disgusting part of Rogue One is like you're saying, it's so removed. That yeah. It's like when you remember that they're Nazis, it's like, is this supposed to feel awesome? <laughs> like, yeah. am I supposed to see them like rolling through with their tanks and be like, that's fucking cool. It's just kind of it's really bizarre. Uh, but anyway, off of Star Wars. I mean, we have plenty of time to talk. This chase scene goes on for a long fucking time. This chase time. scene does go on for a long time, but we're finally about to get to the moment where he calls him a pussy face. So I'll finally stop saying that. I'm not sure if I believe you, but okay. For this episode. Okay, pussy face. He just said it. Now, something I don't like about this moment is that, like, the Predator is about to detonate his fucking bomb. It's like, are you kidding me? It's like, for real. The Predator is about to give up right now? That is so fucking lame. I'm not sure if it's a give up thing. I think it's a we've been discovered type thing. Because, like, I got the impression, because, like, he wasn't... He did it when he was defeated in there, but like not to imply that alien versus predator is canon and all of this, but like they blew up the temple in alien versus predator. If they were about to lose to destroy all evidence that they had been there and the fact to make sure that the aliens wouldn't go and consume all of earth. So like, and Arnold didn't get a trophy for beating a predator and predator one. So I'm assuming they don't count if they blow themselves up as humans beating them i think it's just a oh, okay well i fucked up i don't get any more trophies and we need to cover our tracks now i don't know if it's covering our tracks so much as like i would rather destroy everything than like lose any sense of like agency or autonomy you know like i like i will blow up the entire thing to spite everything to spite all life around me rather than actually concede that i am not like the top life form in this vicinity, you know? Yeah. Um, but like, I, I don't know. I just don't believe that the predator would just like fucking give up because it's like on a ledge. I don't know. Predators in general suffer from what uh, is called the Klingon paradox of how has this like society that completely focuses on killing and maiming other things developed faster than light travel. Are there scientist predators? <laughs> Are there ship designing predators? It's just something that you're like, eh, okay. Well, it's not important. No, in this sense, it's not. And personally, I think the Klingon paradox is a misnomer because you do meet Klingon scientists and whatnot in some funny episodes where it's like one of them is traumatized <laughs> because she's just constantly used to being yelled at and abused by her own people. But You're not tough enough. Basically, it's like they don't respect science. <laughs> you nerd. But no, I don't think that that stuff is like fundamentally important to the Predator. I think once you start looking at the Predator in that way, it's a little bit like too literal for me. Um, I, I think No, I know. It's not yeah. important. It's very cinema sinsy, but it, it's just something that caught my imagination in this. Because I think the thing that's more important to the Predator is like its character that is brought out by yes. these little details. Because yeah. even though there are multiple Predators, like the Predator is its own thing. Like, yeah. He is his own type of like slasher villain esque thing. Right? Yeah. And uh, I don't know. I, I just think that like one of the defining features is that indefatigability. <laughs> I guess I don't know if that's a word, but the idea that the predator is fucking relentless, it's not going to fucking blow itself up because it's on a ledge. That's ridiculous. It's going to do some sort of like 
bizarre somersault and then, uh, you know, run up a wall or something. It's like, oh my God, it's been outclassed by Danny Glover because it got knocked off balance. Nope, I don't believe it. Also, this sequence goes on for so fucking long. I think it's funny the in a schlocky way the idea of the predator just like bursting through walls. And you know, scaring if this women. was a Michael Bay movie, the widow would, or that not the widow, the old woman would be like, "Oh, Herb, I guess Taco Night was too much for you this week." It was oh, the it'd be so bad. You it'd know, be so bad. You know, that's what would be happening. So I, I guess we're good that we don't live in the timeline where '90s Michael Bay directed Predator Two. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, as it is, the scene is drawn out too much. It's just too long. And here's the thing. I really like where this scene ends up. I really do. I like going inside the Predator ship. That's fun. I like the fact that we find out that the Predators have been coming to Earth for hundreds of years. I like the fact that they give people who defeat them in honest combat a trophy as a reward of that. I love that. That's good bit character building for your fucking killer. But it's... Uh, it takes so fucking long to get there. As soon as Gary Busey died, we should be fucking picking up the pace, everybody. Yeah, this moment specifically takes so much time. And it's because it's like we couldn't think of a better thing than to try to have like a situation where Danny Glover has to magically get across an alleyway 30 feet in the air. This is hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> the way the predator punches through the set wall is so fucking funny. It's just like, eh. <laughs> it's so great. <laughs> oh man. That's so good. Honestly, if the movie was immediately after, um, immediately after Gary Bussey died, if it became that level of schlock, it would be great. It would be like A plus, A plus. Yeah, that's the thing this thing needs. The ending, if it's not going to be like the serious super primal showdown, and it's not going to be a team building cop exercise. Make it just zany and just, weird. Just schlock. Yeah. Schlock it up. Yeah, yeah. Just have the Predator, you know, punch through walls and like disrupt old ladies bingos nights or whatever. Yeah. I would have loved if the Predator was in the elevator. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I'm going to defeat you. I'm going to trick you into climbing down the elevator shaft and then just fucking lower the elevator on you. And the Predator, clever. And the predator speaks in English again and it says, going down. Oh, there you go. See, I could, I could direct the schlock version of Predator <laughs> too. It would have been great. Uh, the Predator speaks in English and it goes, some motherfuckers are always trying to ice skate uphill. <laughs> Danny Glover goes, what, what the, the fuck <laughs> are you talking about? <laughs> what? I just love the origin behind that line of just... That's just something Wesley Snipes said. I want to know what he said it about originally. Uh, what was he talking about when he... What was he responding to? I, it was a meeting with the produce, like the producers of the movie or something like yeah. that. From what I understand, but like, what were they talking about? Where he's like, some of the fuckers are always trying to ice skate uphill. And then David Geiler is just like, it, it, yeah, yeah, they really are, aren't they? In fact, we should put that in. From the what movie. I understand, it was in a response to like somebody like making things more difficult for the production of the movie. <laughs> but oh man. It's probably one of the best lines in film history, honestly. That line and... <laughs> Unintentionally. That line and uh, the line from the 1973 movie, The Baby, directed by Ted Post. The line where uh, a woman gets ap approached by a, a weird man at a party. The weird man goes, you have lovely skin. She's like, thank you. And he goes, yeah, I'm a real skin freak. <laughs> That's the other best line in film history. <laughs> And uh, pussy face. Of course. I, I knew you were lying to me. That was the last time. That was the last time. No, you already lied. Max, we're talking about the most famous moment of this movie. Oh, God, look, it's an alien skull, everybody. We should make two terrible films. And 
yeah, countless comic books and action figures mm. and video games based off of this. You know, at the time, I get the impression it was a real spur of the moment thing. Yeah, that they decided to do this. And you know what, Max? If you saw this opening, no, that's weekend, cool as fucking shit. I love you. That. Would saw that and you'd be like, oh my god, that's so cool. And that was the before the age of cinematic universes. That's yeah. just like a cool fucking thing. I love that. Yeah, you'd be like, that's fucking cool. Um, and they do it for two seconds. Which is exactly how much time they should be doing it. They zoom in on it enough so that you get a good chance to look at it. And they're like, oh, did you see that, guys? Yeah. Yeah. Um, You know what, Max? It's fucking cool. It's cool that they did that. But unfortunately, I think time has shown that that ironically has become the most unfortunate part of this movie. (laughs) Yeah. You know, weirdly, like, I think the AVP movies doomed the Alien franchise and the Predator franchise, you know? Because there was that whole thing, you know, when we were, um, we did the original AVP as a test episode, and we, you know... We we, were miserable throughout the entire time. (laughs) It it, it was fine. Um, I was miserable throughout the entire time. But we were doing research for it, right? And one of the things that you learn when you you do research for the AVP movie is that... uh, you know, before that movie was made, it, it was kind of inspired, not inspired. It was made because of the success of Freddy versus Jason. It was made in a ridiculous short turnaround time, yes. too. Yeah. Freddy versus Jason was successful in 2003. And I think the movie overall was like less than 14 months from green light to release, which is insane. They for only a movie shot like it that. for six months, I believe. Yeah. And they edited it for, for, for like three months. Yeah. And then was out. Um, but, you know, like before that, I think there was serious movement of like a James Cameron produced uh, additional alien sequel with Sigourney Weaver returning. And while that doesn't have anything to say about the Predators, what that does mean is that the Predators could have been brought back in a way that was potentially better than AVP, you know, or just have like. Make a third Predator movie or have a cute nod back. Like when you go into whatever alien queen room, have like different races like fucking cocoons or whatever whatever the plot of that yeah. movie might have been yeah something like that yeah all i can all i can assume though is that that movie was probably going to be more interesting than avp have a predator skull and a pile of bones near the alien lair or sure like whatever that. it is yeah. whatever it is um but either way the 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 unfortunate thing about avp being a bad movie is that it ties up two franchises you know what i'm saying yeah and that sucks ass that sucks so bad at the same time, though, you look at AVP, Max, and I feel like in your gut, you know that it could be a cool pairing. Oh, yeah. Well, like, I haven't read any of the comic books or played any of the games, but I know some of those are fairly well liked. And Yeah. I mean, for some reason, you look at them and you're like, they kind of work together. I don't know. Well, it's you, you have, like, the ultimate hunter and the ultimate hunting animal that's true that's true max that's what it is yeah and it is a cool concept it just has yet to be pulled off well in film because it could be they just have to commit to it it in a way that's not cynical the problem is though you need a human element and either you have a shit ton of human characters in the middle and you suffer from godzilla syndrome of get out of my way human characters i just want to see the cool monsters yeah or you have to humanize one of them. As we learned in AVP, that does not work. Because then you make the Predator a bitch. Yeah. And it's just like, this is stupid. Like, you're just removing the quality of the Predator that makes it interesting. Make it a silent film. <laughs> that would be cool. That would be cool if they did Nobody that. talks the entire fucking movie. But also, you need it to be, wha- not wacky, but you need it to be very irreverent and Honestly, high energy. the only scene that got a slight, like, smile out of me in avp is the scene where the predator places the self-destruct bomb and like points at it and makes like a boom gesture with his hands and i'm just like okay that's that's as goofy as at least he's not talking yeah (laughs) (laughs) he gives him the gun you've you've bested a predator and Strange single combat. Now let me walk off into this matted background. <laughs> but Max, I think the gun is interesting because it, no, I like it. It's one of my favorite parts of the movie. I think if you again, if we're looking at the hidden movie underneath this one, the one that is more tied into this subtext of like the idea of like American violence and so the American not even frontier. Necessarily 
Latin American. It's uh, colonial yeah. violence. That That's pre-America. That's British imperialism right Yeah, there. like I would... There's a way to make the the... I think there's a serious way to take the predators and say like they arrived on earth with the advent of colonialism because that brings a new level of violence to the world that we had not seen previously. I would, it would have been interesting. Like I said, I don't want any more predator movies, but if we get any more ones, I would love to them to be interesting and take angles like that. Because the hunter figure is such an interesting figure to look at in terms of like, dehumanization and and the idea of like um colonialism you know like i I think it's interesting to look at the hunter and the hunting of humans as something that really speaks to like a colonial uh uh sort of project i guess um and i just i don't know i find it interesting it would have been cool if they went in that direction but you also have to have legitimate like political convictions to actually know that you're headed in that direction and i don't think this movie does that because I don't think this movie really knows what its politics are. But still, at the end of the day, what happens? The police are totally useless, ineffectual. The feds are totally ineffectual, evil. They perpetuate everything that happens. Uh, and absolutely nothing changes. Nothing has changed from the start of the movie to the end of the movie. You know that the Predators, even though they've been defeated this one time, they'll be back because apparently they're always back and they have always been here. So in the end, I feel like the ending is kind of uh, nihilistic, Max. Yeah. Um, which is an interesting choice for them to commit to. It's another downbeat ending after the first one, where after the first one, I think, you know, you look at Arnold sitting in the helicopter and he seems like he's kind of like psychologically defeated. Yeah. Like he didn't really escape, um, which is an interesting move to pull. And then this one, he's kind of just like covered in ash and it's like, Kind of like this ghostly, he's just like a husk, you know? Doesn't say anything. Just kind of walking out like a zombie, you know? It's kind of freaky and and weird. I just wish they had done more of that kind of stuff. Yeah. I really appreciate that they didn't have him say anything, to be honest. Yeah. What the fuck was he supposed to do? I don't know. But it's clear that the predators are not going away is the thing that's interesting. Yeah. Well, that's been Predator 2, everyone. Yep. Uh, that's been Predator 2. Um, interesting movie. A uh, movie that I think for the predator franchise was like very much like a crossroads movie and they went in the wrong direction. (laughs) And I wish we could go back. I wish we could go back. That's a good way of putting it. Yeah. I I feel like this movie more so than the first one, maybe helped illuminate what predator could, can be, could be. And I really just wish that they had followed that thematic instinct more to make it a more overtly political, um, monster that's tied in with like you know the evils of the american empire and and imperialism it would have been interesting sounds to me like you're trying to put politics in my monster movie austin i can't believe you yeah it's not like monsters ever have deeper meaning to them no uh and if you'd like to hear politics in other monster movies if you'd like to hear us put the politics into other monster movies i should say you should listen to those episodes at spectatorfilmpodcast.com or find us on itunes spotify or stitcher we also have a letterboxd and Max has an OnlyFans. It's pretty expensive, though. <laughs> Max, do you have anything else to say about this movie? Yeah, my OnlyFans ha- uh, handle is Pussyface. <laughs> Goodbye, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>